Okay, well, good morning, you guys. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate you being with us at Volunteer Caucus. I know a lot of you have traveled really far. Um, and thank you especially for joining us at this session, which is a small event, a big impact. Really pleased to have you here. Um, I know a lot of you, but my name is Ryan Olson. Um, I'm a member of the Global Alumni Programs team at the Alumni Association, so I work often uh, with our international alumni, supporting them, building alumni clubs and networks around the world. Um, and because the focus of today's session is to discover what works well to build clubs, volunteer groups, and networks in sections of the, um, in parts of the world really where we have a smaller alumni population, we're really, ex I'm excited to be a part of, of this discussion. Um, and when we worked together and thought about what would work best, um, we have always known that it's, it's the best Chicago discussions are when we connect you directly with um, other members of the Chicago community, so we thought a panel format would be great. Um, and to give you an idea of, of the format for today's session, I'll in introduce each of our panelists in just a moment, but I'm going to invite them to talk briefly about their volunteer role. Um, share with you some of the best practices that they've discovered, some of the successes they've experienced, and of course there are always some challenges, so we'll encourage them to talk about that. Um, and our, our moderator will then lead us through a brief Q&A session. But we really, obviously, this you know we want this to be um, an informal discussion. We want you to participate, so at any time, please ask questions. Um, you know, we, we really want this to be in, in the spirit of the, the Chicago conversation. So if you would uh, allow me to introduce our, our panelists, and we can begin. Um, first, we have our, our moderator, Rolf Friedley. Um, Rolf is actually a member of our Alumni Board of Governors, so many of you may know him, and he has played an integral role in the development of the Chicago Booth Alumni Club in Switzerland, and he is a huge advocate, um, always reminding us of the unique needs and the importance of thinking about our international alumni community. I also understand from reading your bio this morning that you like ice hockey and wind then we also have Samuel Cohen Salam, who is our alumni club president in, in Paris and a very good friend to us. And Samuel has done amazing amounts of tremendous work revitalizing a club in a community where truly um, that, had, that just had not been the case. His work has been very important to the center in Paris as well. Um, and just has done amazing work building all kinds of creative programs like the Chicago Salon and a Paris Guide mentoring program, and so I'm, I'm hoping he'll talk more about that for you today. Then we have Scott McGarvey, and Scott has three degrees from the University of Chicago. Uh, yes. So he, I am we're a very happy he can be here with us today. Um, Chicago, er, Scott is the head of the Chicago Booth Marketing Roundtable, and he's the vice president of membership within the Chicago Booth Alumni Club. He's been an active supporter of alumni affairs for more than 12 years. Uh, and runs a consulting practice here in Chicago. So thank you for being with us. We also have Luke Rodehorst. Luke uh, is a graduate from the college, 2009, so he's one of our younger alumni volunteers. Um, currently works for Google and um, is the vice president of the Ann Arbor Detroit Alumni Club and the co-chair of this year's Phoenix Fest. And he has done amazing work in Fest event this year, so we really want him to tell you more about that and, and what worked for him there. Um, and finally, we have Paula Mikret. Um, Paula is a 1990 graduate of the business school who's recently become involved with the Booth Alumni Club here in Chicago. Paula has organized a series titled Rainmaking, Turning Relationships into Economic Value. She's the acting chair for the Continuing Education Committee, but will soon be moving to a new role. Uh, where she'll be responsible for contacting new club members and matching them with committees that are seeking help. And that's something that we know is really important, especially when you're working in a, a section of the alumni community where you want to involve more people um, and sort of share share the responsibilities. So thank you and welcome to everyone. Um, and I will, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> so... Um, my name is Rolf Friedley. Um, I'm from Switzerland, and uh, I am an MBA 96. Uh, in fact, uh, IXP1, uh, and that's something special. I feel really privileged to, uh, to have that little title, IXP1, and IXP stands for International Executive MBA Program. 
uh, today it was renamed in EXP. So uh, anyhow, <clears throat> so the IXP uh, that was uh, back in uh, 93, 94 when the uh, business school decided that they really truly want to become global and started off with a, with a campus in Europe and started with you recruiting students and uh, I must say the, uh, the students I had in my first class were very diverse from all over the world and uh, entrepreneurial as well <clears throat> because um, there was no track record, the school had no track record in Europe and uh, <clears throat> you know the crowd, my fellow students, uh, we thought you know what is, uni what, what is the University of Chicago and the reputation and the academic vigor uh, of that university was just, you know, excellent. And that's why a, a lot of people without any track record, they subscribe to that and say, well, let's, let's do it. So that's uh, IXP1. So I'm really glad I've done this. Uh, so it's a really an excellent school, a fantastic experience I had. And um, maybe you recall just recently uh, The Economist wrote that uh, the uh, University of Chicago Global uh, MBA, full-time MBA uh, program, number one in the world. So that's also, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, just a stamp of approval, I guess. So <clears throat> after my graduation, I thought there must be a platform in Switzerland, there must be a platform, there must be a forum to interact with my fellow students. Um, and uh, I sort of created that uh, alumni club in Switzerland out of uh, really nothing. We had, uh, before we had just one dinner per year uh, of the students uh, uh, that were existent. Uh, at that moment in time, there were about uh, maybe 70, 80 uh, alumni in Switzerland only. Today, it's about 350. Um, we started off really small. Um, <clears throat> it's a... Uh, the biggest problem was to get uh, the addresses, uh, and then you send out letter. You know, email was not really existent at that moment in time, so uh, you you type letters and you send them out. And I started off really with small events, uh, with five, five, excuse me, five or ten people. Uh, and over the years, we had uh, a participation then of 20, 30, 40 people. Um, <clears throat> But that was nice, of course. We had, uh, you know, we had uh, a lot going. Uh, it was a good club, basically. But we thought, uh, <clears throat> what should we do to make something really exceptional out of it? And we had this idea of uh, to join forces with other schools. So we did two initiatives. One initiative was um, a joint event, simply a joint event. So together with Stanford, uh, Wharton, Michigan, and Kellogg, uh, we organi organized uh, uh, events with uh, leading speakers, really truly leading speakers in Switzerland, gathering a crowd of 100, 120, 150 people. And the way we did it, and th that's my, that might be also an example uh, for, for you to do something similar, um, <clears throat> we as Chicago, we organized the first event. So we set the stage, how it should be, recruited a fantastic speaker and then the other year for example Wharton did it or in next year another school so every five years we we organize basically one of these events and that's uh, it's fantastic because you work one year and then during five years you basically uh, can you know uh, have these events uh, almost automatically and you can invite your alumni which is great. The second initiative goes into the same direction, but it's uh, much bigger. Um, <clears throat> we were uh, founding members of, uh, of uh, an initiative called the Joint um, uh, Jack Joint Alumni Conference. So that the leading business schools in the world together, the alumni together in Switzerland, they formed this and we made a one, two day event out of it. So same, same concept basically where we can invite now our uh, alumni to participate in a in an almost world-class event um, <clears throat> and it's just uh, you know these alumni so I think uh, with a lot of creativity uh, also if you're in a, in, a, in, a, in a small jurisdiction 
uh, you have not many alumni, you have not thousands, you can do something uh, great out of it. And maybe uh, a bit of lessons learned also from our side, and I would like to draw your attention to that fact that it's, uh, it's you know, it's important, one has not to, uh, to lose sight of that, or is the succession. Because if you have leaders in a, in a certain uh, area, in a, in, in a club, you have to think about succession because it's, uh, it's important to have the right people at the right place. So that's one element. And the other element, which I find also important, is if you start, is corporate governance. If you start off with, uh, with events in the early days, of course, you have to be very extremely flexible. But later on, there should be processes in place. There should be a lot of interaction with the alumni offices to get also feedback. Uh, so that's also the second one uh, which I draw your attention to. Now, uh, this is it from my side. We have uh, four panelists. And um, we thought that we would structure the discussion a bit around uh, certain topics. The topics are outreach, recruitment, um, basically, how to boost uh, participation. Second one would be uh, participation, sustainability, um, <clears throat> how to encourage attendance from smaller alumni populations as well. And the third one would be events that can be done on a small scale and the type of resources you would need for that. And maybe a second, uh, the last one would be planning. How do you plan events? You need to have, you need to plan them in, adva in advance. And how do you do them? So I would uh, maybe start uh, with uh, Luke, who will tell us a bit uh, what you have been doing and your lessons learned as well, and yeah. the challenges, of course. Yeah, thank you very much, Rolf, and thank you everybody for coming, and thank you to the university for putting this together. This is my first one. I've already learned a lot and looking forward to uh, the rest of the events. Um, so I am from the Alumni Club in Ann Arbor, Detroit, and really um, uh, I'm going to talk about specifically Phoenix Fest and the success we had there. Uh, last year, there were 13 people at the event, and this year we had over 30. Um, so it was great to see that kind of energy, that kind of enthusiasm uh, this year. And I guess where uh, the, the foundation of this actually started here in Hyde Park, uh, I, you, 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 uh, I, I was a, considering a, being a geography major, so I'm really interested in space and like, um, you know, um, how... Uh, how certain um, places or, or locations or geographies and, and how they're unique. So I'm in Ann Arbor and I'm thinking, you know, how, how is Ann Arbor unique? Um, and, it's, uh, and where are alumni going to be in this unique community? And if you think about it, Ann Arbor is mostly, a lot of the alumni are students again. So it's this transient um, population, people who are there two years for law school, two years for business school, and, and then gone. So how do you capitalize on this very uh, transient population that's in this particular place? Um, and so a lot of the, when thinking about that, uh, basically the, the foundation came, uh, came down to reaching out to these particular schools. So who do we know in leveraging the university? Who do we know in the law school? Who do we know in the business school? Um, and really, pulling together a um, uh, committee uh, of about there were four of us who helped in the outreach um, and recruitment and making sure that we had those bases covered for those unique uh, bodies that were there in Ann Arbor. So that was really the foundation there. So thinking about what makes my community unique, how do we uh, play up? on that unique aspect of the community and then reach those those audiences who are there. Um, so that's definitely um, something that to think about when we have these smaller communities, what makes you unique? <coughs> definitely think about that. Um, and then also, it, it's a lot of it is just doing the legwork. We made over 300 calls uh, following up with emails. We had a Facebook page. So uh, leveraging what the university was giving us in terms of the data uh, they have on their end with who's in the, who's in the area. Um, and so literally making phone calls, talking to people, 
sending emails. I mean, it sounds kind of uh, old fashioned, but it, it we had huge success um, uh, just getting on the phone. Um, and we made it kind of a fun thing too. So we got together as a, a committee and we had like a dinner party and we said, you know, let's, you know, before dinner, let's make, you know, 150 calls. Let's have, you know, a, a drink and uh, appetizers <laughs> and, and make another 150 calls, something like that. And so, and so it became, uh, we had this great rapport as a committee and a lot of energy there. And, uh, that that was that was also a lot of fun. So um, you know, it, it may sound like a daunting task to call so many people, but uh, you know, if you break it down like that and uh, you know, make it make it a fun event, uh, an, an alumni event itself. So may, maybe that was the um, small event, big impact. The four of us getting together and you know, sharing a meal and making these calls, which then led to uh, this uh, great Phoenix Fest, um, and. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the main takeaways, I think, are thinking, again, just what makes your community unique, pounding the pavement, like doing the, the legwork in terms of reaching out to people. Um, and then uh, I think in a, in a follow-up to that, like how are we going to extend this, is um, really uh, making sure that w just communicating to those who are you know, first-year law students that at, when they're second year law students, they need to be, you know, reaching out to the people who are new there. Same with the business school students. So making sure um, we have contact and are maintaining contact with uh, the connections we made there. Um, and uh, also, I, I think the true success of Phoenix Fest will be uh, determined by the events that happen after Phoenix Fest. So. Um, Oh, sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Phoenix Fest. Um, it, it's this y young alumni um, uh, social event, pretty much. It, it says a welcoming to the class of 2010 this year. So you're welcoming the new class who's just graduated to the alumni community. And it's it, it's straight up social. So we had ours at, we, we had, you know, like wine and appetizers at a restaurant in Ann Arbor. Um, and on the same day, so they all happen September 23rd, and uh, various alumni clubs across the country um, have them. Um, and uh, yeah, so there were. It was great in that uh, it is purely social. So everybody there w was was having fun. There was uh, someone who came who was looking to hire people for um, his startup who was there. So um, putting him, he came there to meet younger people to hire for his. Um, for his for his business, so uh, it, it was a great cross section of people. Um, definitely a lot of energy. And what I was um, saying before, I think the success of Phoenix Fest is going to be determined by what happens next. And I've already heard of two people who, you know, just met each other at Phoenix Fest. They like road trip together from Ann Arbor to Chicago to go hang out. And uh, there, there's all the we're going to have more informal uh, get-togethers. Uh, afterwards, so if it's you know watching a football game together, going to uh, the Harper lecture or whatever it is, um, I think these continued events after this one uh, bigger event is really going to uh, determine how successful it was, and I'm I'm really excited. So, okay. Um, we were we're at someone's house. Uh, someone was upstairs. Someone was on the front porch, backyard, that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, it, it was really funny, and so we, it, it, and it became this kind of like fun competition. Be like, I got three people who answered their phone. Just like, oh no way! So yeah, but we we're leaving voicemails, um, and also the important part of this is some sometimes uh, people's numbers will be for their home. Um, they their families are from Michigan, but they may be in Chicago. So another great thing about calling these people is it's really helpful to get uh, updates on this information. And then you could tell, and you know, some of the people, um, they'd be like, oh, Phoenix Fest, is that happening in Chicago? They'd be like, yeah, it's the 23rd, like, check it out, things like that. So even if you, it, it's great in that you're um, updating information, uh, which is which is super important, and then also getting people out to the event, so. Okay, thank you, Lucas. And as always, it's, uh, it's hard work, huh? Sometimes uh, coupled with fun, mm -hmm. right? Okay, Paula, can you say something? By the way, we uh, <clears> have <throat> questions uh, also at the end, maybe one or so.
question is okay, but then I think okay. thank you for it. It was interesting when we were doing the planning call for this, how different our communities are, uh, Luke's and mine. Um, I'm here in Chicago at the, the Chicago Booth Alumni Club, and um, our issues are very different, although I don't think unique. Um, We've got a lot of people that are working very long hours. Uh, people tell me that they've got family and other commitments, and a lot of people have very long commutes. For myself, I live out in, or I work out in the suburbs, and I live out in the suburbs. And to get into an, for an event into the city, it's a I can count on at least a two and a half hour round trip. So it takes a lot to get me to get into the city, out uh, Naperville. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So. Right, and and so I talk to people about what kinds of events they want to, for us to put on, and a lot of people will tell me I only want I will only come to events if basically they can get me a, a promotion this month. You know, I want I want something that's going to be very career oriented and very uh, you know in, oriented to today my career today. And so I've had a couple of interesting conversations with people. I said to somebody, oh, okay, so you probably didn't come to, haven't come to any of our, like, Cubs games. Well, yeah, I, I do that. Oh, okay. Well, we were thinking about doing an event. My boss is a, a, an amateur race car driver, and he's offered to teach a class on how to drive, how to how to race. Uh, you probably wouldn't be interested in that. Well, yeah, I, I would do that. Um, and, and, and so the, the point that, you know, some of these conversations is that even with the amount of time and commitment people have to make, if you find something that interests people, they will come. Um, and so we, we have had some things that have drawn uh, crowds of people. One of the most successful things that I've been involved in is called rainmaking. Um, it's about how to turn relationships into economic value. And it's about, um, it, it's for people that have a component of building uh, business in their, in their uh, uh, jobs. People like lawyers, accountants, uh, people who aren't professional salespeople, but have responsibility for growing their business. And we're doing this for the third time this year, and it's been a sellout every year. And I invariably have people the weekend before the class starts, please let me in, I have to be in this class, you know, that kind of thing. And we've also scheduled a monthly series of discussions just among people who are interested in this topic to get together and talk to each other and to help each other with this kind of topic. So it's been, it, it's been very successful. But, um, but so far we've had, at least my group has had the most success with career-oriented kinds of things. And typically what, what we do a lot of are the softer skills, the kinds of things people didn't learn in business school, and they get out into their careers in maybe five years or two years or a day and a half into their careers, and they realize they should have learned how to give a presentation or they should have learned how to negotiate with people or how to, how to build a persuasive argument. So, so we've done a lot of those kinds of things and had a lot of success with them. Um, I would love to get uh, more involved in the social kinds of things that Luke was talking about. So far, I haven't had much luck convincing people to help me organize some of those things, but I think it would be really good because we have a lot of very introverted people in our club. They come to presentations. They say they want to come for networking. They come for presentations. They bring a book. They read until the presentation starts, and then when it's over, they go home. Um, so we're not building relationships like we really should and, and, and could, and I'd like to be able to learn from Luke is, what Luke is doing right now. Um, another challenge that we've got, and, and I don't know if, I'd love to hear from people if you've had some luck in doing this, is we've had presentations or events that have sold out, and then we've got half a room that's empty because people ended up traveling at the last minute, or they, you know, they, they had something that came up, and I've got this list of people that want to get into the event and can't because it's sold out, but then I have uh, empty seats. One of the things that we've done to deal with this situation is that that we've built in costs into our program so that we can charge people. Mm -hmm. And and so, it, you know, we'll serve dinner or we'll give away a book as part of the presentation or something so that we can charge $25, $30 and, and have people feel like if they're not going to show up, it's going to cost them something. What I'd really like to do, um, and that I, I'm going to talk to uh, talk to the people that do our registration side, is 
um, I know some clubs in our area do this, is they don't charge for events because we also hear from people saying they can't come to events because they cost too much. They're out of work or you know whatever, and, and they don't want to spend that much money. And I understand that, but some clubs are doing something where they take a credit card for registration and they only charge it if you don't show up. So it costs nothing if you come to the event, but it'll cost you thirty dollars if you don't show up. And um, and and that for the the clubs that I are I'm in that have done that, that seems like it works really well. That people at least feel like they've got a responsibility to cancel out or do something if they're not going to show up, so that you ha at least have an idea of how many people are going to be there. You don't have a speaker sitting there looking at an empty room. Those kinds of things. So. Those are some of the things that are that uh, that I've experienced in my work. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Paula. Uh, very important. Now, uh, Samuel, uh, let's move over <coughs> across the water in France. What are you doing there? Thank you, Ron. The Club of France was relaunched 18 months ago. Before that, it's there have been five events or six events over the past eight years, and the last event I've been to, there were three alum, alumni from Chicago. So after I pushed a friend of mine to go to the University of Chicago, we met with Stephanie, and she sent me an email, please, we we'll want to relaunch it. That's a great idea. How many alumni do we have? And she told me, oh, we have 600 alumni in Paris as well. Great, we have a decent size to work with. I received a beautiful database, 150 working emails. It's a bit smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those people are not in Paris, you know. But it's so what we did is like through Facebook, LinkedIn, we reached out to those people. You do a search within your neighborhood, and then one of the thought we had is like, great, I know what I like, discussions, cooking class. What do people like? What would they be interested in? So we actually organized a survey for our alumni that we sent to each alumni, being like, please be informed via LinkedIn, we're launching, relaunching the Alumni Club of Paris, and take five minutes, ten questions, not more. With those ten questions, we're able to know which type of events I like, debates, cooking class, museums, uh, panelists, discussion, professors, what time is most convenient for the people, 7, 8, 8.30. Where in Paris, that was very important. It's a lot of people, as you mentioned, have problem traveling, it's difficult. So we ended up doing something very central because that's how we managed to get to most people and what day and a few other questions to try to analyze our community. Since we analyzed the community, it was great. It's like, okay, what do we do now? And we launched three events where we're, which are working very well, I would like to talk about. The first one is the Chicago Salon where we invite a professor and we have a Paris Center which was professors all year long and students and the philosophy of the club is open to everybody who has an intellectual interest which is like the one we encountered in Chicago. So we have parents, students, alumni and if you want to come with a friend or prosby, you're welcome. A professor comes from 7.30 to 8.30, informal discussion, you have a drink. In Paris, it's easy to have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> then, after that, some people have family obligations, so they can leave. Other people finish later, and they join at around 8.39, and then we have a dinner with a professor. And offering to our alumni database this flexibility enabled us to have events with like 30 people on average. Well, it's great. We had great people, people were very happy, but we're not reaching all of our alumni. So we launched another project, which is the Paris Guide Program. And we've had great alumni in Paris, Dara and Fidan, who did a tremendous job putting it together. The way it works is alumni sign up and be like, I'm willing to host a current exchange student in Paris for an event. It can be a dinner at home, visit to a museum, going to a concert, the student arrives at the center on the first day. They have a list of events with the alumni. They sign up. The Paris Center sends us the name. And we organize the events. And that has been working very well. It enabled us also to reach sometimes alumni where the family obligations are happy to hold because, you know, 
like their child is in Chicago and they would like someone in Chicago to do the same thing somewhere for that child. And that is working very well this year and last year also. To give you an idea, we have 50 exchange students coming to Paris per quarter. Another event we launched to reach a broader base is, as some of you know, like if you have an issue developing your club, most likely other clubs in the region have exactly the same problem. So we teamed up with other clubs and I got involved also with an organization called AUC, which whose job is to federate all the alumni clubs in Paris, share the events. If Harvard organized something, we're invited. If we organize, they're invited. Not for all events, because you want to keep your identity, but for some of them, it was very interesting. And through this, we organized partnership with the American Chamber of Commerce for 4th of July last year. It gives visibility to organize its heaven. You talk with them, they agree, everybody's happy. We organize also a Christmas party with all the various clubs, and we organize a cocktail as a U.S. residency, which drew a different alumni, and it also enabled us to discuss and have more visibility in terms of what we're, we're looking for. The way we constructed the club for like was actually interesting for some clubs which, which are in construction. We have like teams of two or three people in charge of each project. Someone comes like, I have a great idea. I want to do a wine tasting event. Okay. We'll give you the resources, find you another one or two alumni who are interested. It's your project. And people have done a tremendous job. Most likely, if they come to you, they have the same desire and will to promote the University of Chicago. And, you know, trust in an organization is the best thing. And going back to what Ralph was saying, it's also the best way to identify who will be able to be the successor. If those were the three events I wanted to talk about, if you have any other question afterwards, <coughs> it will be with pleasure. And come visit us in Paris. <laughs> okay. It's a great idea, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Samuel, for the invitation. I think that was an invitation, right? <laughs> um, okay, now, Scott, to you. Um. Thank you, Rolf. Uh, yes, just by way of brief background, the roundtables are informal groups of alumni who share a common interest and uh, convene meetings at uh, generally regular intervals. Uh, we have roundtables that are active in several different areas. There's perhaps a dozen of them at the present time. Each sets its own structure, has its own uh, meeting venue, and uh, runs its own uh, programs. Uh, the one I'm involved in is the uh, marketing roundtable. Uh, we have been in existence for about 12 years. Uh, I like to think that um, we've accomplished some truly leading edge uh, presentations at different times, including our most recent uh, meeting on crowdsourcing that uh, included a panel uh, with representatives from three uh, Chicago-based companies that have been pioneers in this area, uh, Groupon and uh, Grubhub and CrowdSpring. Each of these companies is, is in a different, very unique area that, uh, that uses this model, and it's something that uh, many marketers are extremely curious about right now. Uh, we've had steady growth in attendance. We maxed out Room 100 with that meeting. It was, uh, we grew to uh, standing room with that one. Uh, and uh, more broadly, we're reaching a good cross-section of the alumni marketing community, including uh, uh, corporate uh, marketing managers as well as uh, folks from marketing agencies, uh, service providers and boutique consulting firms in marketing, uh, some from the academic sphere, and uh, many from, from not-for-profits as, as well. And uh, uh, we have a a broadening base of uh, participation. More and more alumni are getting involved in our planning process and, and recommending speakers and topics. Uh, our challenges right now, uh, we need a larger room <laughs> and, that's a, uh, and or we need to come up with ways to uh, you know make effective use of the resources that we do have. Uh, and another challenge is that we always are seeking to book these speakers and, and panelists uh, further in advance so that we can uh, uh, give people advance notice to mark their calendars. 
Uh, we're, we're gradually doing better on that, but, uh, but it remains a challenge. Uh, I'll talk just a little bit about uh, what I see as some of our best practices. In terms of our outreach, we rely, I would say, about 90% on word of mouth. And, and we've uh, been able to get uh, great um, uh, second and third generation distribution of our event announcements uh, to, to reach a, a broader cross-section of, uh, of alumni uh, in, in this fashion. We do have an email listserv. Uh, and we all that uh, we maintain. We also post our announcements on the alumni uh, weekly. That's that is maintained by the uh, Chicago Booth Alumni Office. Uh, finally, from time to time, we will hold uh, joint meetings or events with other roundtables or other alumni groups, and uh, we have an informal policy of, of cross promoting e each other's events whenever the topic uh, uh, warrants that and, and may be of interest to another group and then they uh, reciprocate. In terms of how we find our topics and how we do our R&D in effect, uh, we have we encourage audience involvement in topic selection. Uh, from time to time we will have a live uh, brain and interactive brainstorming session with our audience uh, to generate topic ideas. We also uh, have a survey that we set up from time to time. Uh, we're, we're about to do another one, uh, I believe, this this season uh, that gives a, a, a broader uh, uh, number of our audience the opportunity to uh, give their ideas. And um, <clears throat> event management, the, uh, the event it's, itself, we try to add value in as many ways as possible. We have a table that we set up at each event that is for resumes, uh, marketing literature, uh, fact sheets about your company <coughs> if you're in business for yourself and, or, or whatever else within reason you, you would like to uh, uh, communicate uh, about who you are and, and, and what, you, what your own uh, business or career is involved in. Uh, we try to webcast our meetings uh, to reach a broader audience. We have a cash bar both before and after to encourage networking. And uh, we always use name tags so that uh, uh, people can uh, easily get to know each other. Uh, and um, I think I've uh, pretty much covered it. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> it's amazing uh, to hear uh, all your stories. Uh, that's uh, really fantastic. And... Uh, there are so many great ideas. Uh, I put down for myself a couple of uh, these ideas. And uh, like in a corporation, I think um, one has to reinvent themselves from time to time. One has to ask the question also to the audience. Uh, what do you like? Uh, what do you wish? What works? Uh, also a brainstorming. I find that uh, an interesting uh, concept. And... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, one can make uh, also fun out of work, I heard. Uh, so, and then uh, finally join forces with uh, with other teams or with the American Chamber of Commerce in Europe. That's, uh, uh, you know, you have in, all, in, in every country you have an American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've done one event once, but it's also a model for, for other uh, uh, clubs. Now, uh, I think we have a, a couple of minutes for uh, questions and uh, I ask the audience here to ask questions. Yes? Hi. Please. Uh, I'm Tanya Bonsan. I work with my group on the international program. Um, I was wondering, Luke, if you could speak to, um, to Phoenix Fest a little more and say how and if it was uh, for you grounds to recruit more volunteers. Yeah. Um, I, I think that just because of the amount of energy that was there and the the amount of fun that people were having uh, people were wondering when's the next event how can i be involved in uh, the uh two weeks later it was our um uh ann arbor detroit club <coughs> meeting and people were wondering just like how do i you know sign up for that how do i get there so that it was people were um one really excited that there was a community 
um, in the area, and two, were excited, then more excited to get involved. So it was definitely a, a, a great opportunity for people to become aware and stay involved. Yes, please. I want to thank the panelists. Thank you very much. It's all so insightful. Um, I'm involved with in, um, trying to get a nascent uh, Latino Hispanic alumni group with initially a Chicago platform and then possibly a national rollout. Um, my question is for you. Uh, how did you get the person to come from the company and actually perform the networking uh, aspect of, of your meeting, which I think is fabulous. Not only did you have a social mm -hmm. component, but then you had this career component. Right. So it, it, it actually wasn't planned. He just came. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the secret is luck um, there. Uh, yeah, he, he was one of the, uh, he had been called, one of the people who was called. So uh, the, there was that connection there. Um, but uh, there wasn't any, when we were marketing it, it was purely social, um, and he just came looking to recruit people. That's the benefit of a social uh, networking event, or social event, and then you have this. Yeah, you never know. That's what it boils down to. What, uh, <clears throat> what works out also, and what was very popular uh, um, in our country, was uh, that we organize uh, events with uh, headhunters. Uh, very uh, well known, reputable headhunters in our country, and they got together, and it was it was a bit the sense of uh, um, what would they suggest to young people that were looking for jobs, not you know not, not short term but medium term. Uh, so it was a fantastic interaction. Many hours we talked until midnight because it's a it's a very interesting topic, and that can be organized. Uh, I think without any problems because uh, this is a service industry and they they gladly come and and stay there and and answer questions and give advice. The only reason I bring this up is because a lot of alum do ask that if they want to be able to socialize, but yet they want to have that extra component of networking as mm -hmm. uh, from Booth for doing such a stupendous job. Of, mm -hmm. If we can somehow learn from your experience and bring it over to other other groups where you, you're so focused on the networking side and mm -hmm. I think a lot of undergraduates and you know, graduate alum want to have that model also in their clubs and their little affinity groups where not only are you socializing but you're also developing your career context. Yeah. It's, you know, this is a little bit of a side, but um, there's so many people that have so many ideas about this. There are some LinkedIn groups, for example, at the school. I wonder if there could be a subgroup for the people that are organizing events to share. You know, I just had an event that was very successful, or I have a question, um, so that we can do this on an ongoing basis. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Pick your brain, yeah. basically, and say, we can use your idea or your model for what was successful for you and bring it over to our affinity group. Right. And, and what we did with the Rainmakers is we have somebody whose job is to train people um, to do rainmaking, and he's doing this for free for us. And to be quite honest, he's, he does it because he gets to put on his resume, teach a class at Chicago Booth, the you know number one school, you know whatever, and, and he gets business out of it, which is great. So he's giving us a lot of value, and he gets ba a value back from it. I think there was a question over there. Hold on. This is just, I'm Joan Spurl, and I'm a member of the Alumni Board of Governors, and I uh, had been president of the club in Chicago, but six years ago moved to Cleveland, Ohio, and reactivated a club there, and it was through it, I did, it's, since it's called Small Event Big Impact, um, I wanted, some of you may be try, struggling to plan events and only getting small turnouts initially, um, and or have trouble with succession, find more, finding more volunteers. And I'm just finding that if I keep persistently uh, doing things, I'm I'm gradually. I don't even if only for a few people come to some events, I actually value that because one event I planned was with Luke. He was just about six months out of college. Um, he's from Cleveland or the Cleveland area originally, 
And um, so we did a winter welcome home for students. We have the summer send-offs, and then we did a winter welcome home. And uh, not not a whole lot of people came. Luke helped me plan it. However, a couple of alums did come. One who never came to any other events had never come. He'd wanted to, and he'd registered, but he hadn't been able to. And he came, and he's now going to be a key volunteer. He is a key volunteer, and he's helping organize our first career event in November for Career Month. Um, uh, so I just wanted to say that um, those those little those little and and now look what Luke did in in Ann Arbor. He moved to Ann Arbor and and planned Phoenix Fest. Um, so I just I try not to get discouraged. I often will be hitting myself on the head as things are coming up and I'm stressing out about an event and I'm thinking, why do I do this? <laughs> why do I do this to myself? As I'm trying to get people to attend, and I really like the idea of calling over a dinner party and having fun with it. I think that's I, I gotta take advantage of that idea. Um, but but then when people come, even if it's a few people and they have a really great exchange or interaction, which we did at that event, um, it's really worthwhile. Um, and one event that came up that we I've been we've been struggling on the ABG uh, to think about ways to um, fulfill alumni's needs for lifelong learning, um, and we've been talking about it for over a year and trying to figure out how to recreate the classroom experience, particularly some of those of us in the college who really benefited from the Socratic method and discussion. And so um, a lot of things and pieces of things I'd read and conversations we'd had got me thinking that um, there is a way to reinvent the, the classroom experience as an alumni club. Brought it up at a planning meeting. A couple people came and I mentioned this idea of, of trying to, of maybe reading a a piece from the core and then dissecting it together at a meeting. And two alums who came to that planning meeting, they'd never come to a meeting before, they jumped on it, said, we can do that. And they named it when they called it, they're calling, we're calling it the core now that you're paying attention because in the college it's the common <laughs> core. And um, we were paying attention back then, but you know, it's a whole different thing when you're out of college and you know and you want to revisit so we're next week we're having our first core now that you're paying attention book club um and we're reading plato's republic i've read 10 pages um <laughs> and i'm going to suggest something a little shorter next time it doesn't have to be the whole thing i just want to discuss so anyway and o only if a few people come to that it's the two a few people who've registered have never come to any of our events yet and I mean, I just hope it will grow, and I actually hope it'll be replicated around the country. So, <laughs> and and do you know? I want to add to that, Joan. Um, one thing that's important to consider are the resources that are available to you. I, I understand that not everyone will have a center to work with, where faculty members are coming. Um, you know, every every month. Uh, but there are a lot of things that are available that you might not know about. There's a Mind Online resource. I'll ask Rachel to pull it up on the, on the computer for you. Where we have, where this actually, where this discussion will eventually live and uh, where you can find all kinds of faculty lectures, um, all kinds of events from campus online. So even small gatherings of alumni focused around something like this and then a discussion to follow could be great. Um, and we're we're going to also have a Lati Hamantash uh, debate viewing party together um, in April. Um, and I'm just working on that with the Cleveland Hillel. So uh, it's going to be open to the wider public in the Northeast Ohio area. But again, that's something that could be done on a very small scale where you just, because there's on YouTube and you can also get the Hillel directory to send to CVDs of the of past Lati Hamantash debate. So that's something I've been talking about for years. And I'm hoping that will happen. You can do that in Paris. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Let's let's do it in Paris. Helen. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, unfortunately, the time is uh, running out. Um, uh, small event, big impact. Thanks to you. Thanks to okay. the panelists. Thank thanks to all the comments. Uh, uh, big thank you also for the alumni office for organizing this, uh, uh, to, to Ryan, uh, for this lovely introduction. 
uh, to all of you volunteers for the University of Chicago and finally for the University of Chicago for being such a great place. So thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.